Please open your Bible to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. There's a saying and it goes like this. Those who can't do, teach. And yet if someone knows you can't do something, you might lose credibility in your ability to be able to teach. Uh, There's credibility that comes with success. Have you ever had that where you're doing something and someone who's worse than you is trying to give you pointers and you're just like, come on, you're doing worse than I am. If you've ever golfed with me, you would not be eager to get golf pointers from me. Uh, The moment you saw the outcome of me swinging a club at a golf ball, I would lose credibility immediately. Well, it seems that there may be some credibility issues with Paul as well before the Colossians. The Colossians are receiving this instruction regarding the gospel and Christ from Paul, but they know he's in prison. And so Paul in these verses is really going to set forth an answer to the seemingly negative circumstances he finds himself in and help the Colossians reconcile the fact that Paul has been imprisoned for the gospel he is promoting. He's going to help them understand his own suffering, which he is experiencing, and actually demonstrate that his circumstances and activities for Christ actually confirm his faithfulness and trustworthiness as a minister on behalf of Christ, rather than bring it into question. If you remember, as Paul has just been talking about the reconciling work of Christ, and in verse 23 of chapter 1, he speaks to the hope of the gospel and says, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. And the word for minister is the word we get the word deacon from, yet Paul isn't using it here in reference to the official office of deacon, but rather to refer to the reality that he is a servant of God. And if you remember from last time we were together in Colossians, the word for minister wasn't a prestigious one, but it was used in reference to waiting tables and probably better understood, not even as a waiter, but more in line with a a busboy. Paul is referencing himself as a minister on behalf of Christ for the sake of the body wasn't a statement of self-exaltation, but yet he is demonstrating himself as one who is under the authority of God, striving on behalf of God. And in so doing, he is going to share with the Colossians the reality of his ministry on behalf of Christ, that they may have an increased, instilled confidence in his instruction as instruction that is trustworthy and coming ultimately from the Lord himself. Let's read together Colossians 1. We're going to start in verse 24 and go through the end of the chapter to verse 29. So Colossians 1, starting in verse 24. Paul says this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church. In filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for Paul's ministry. We thank you for his diligence and labor on your behalf so that 
believers might benefit from his ministry. And this morning, as we look at your word, I pray that we would benefit from him, from Paul and his faithfulness, that we would benefit from your word, Lord, that we would see what we must about you and your greatness, that we would be faithful servants as well on your behalf. And we ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, Paul demonstrates himself to be a faithful and trustworthy minister of Christ. Paul demonstrates himself to be a faithful and trustworthy minister of Christ. Paul is a faithful and trustworthy minister of Christ. And in the section of scripture we are looking at this morning, we see how he has demonstrated himself to be this. Paul demonstrates himself to be a faithful and trustworthy minister of Christ. The first demonstration that Paul, that demonstrates Paul is a faithful and trustworthy minister is this. Number one, Paul rejoices in the inevitable sufferings relating to Christ. Paul rejoices in the inevitable sufferings relating to Christ. Look at verse 24 again. Paul says this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Paul rejoices in the inevitable sufferings he is experiencing relating to Christ. And verse 24 begins with Paul stating, Now I rejoice in my sufferings. This is an unusual statement to make. To rejoice in sufferings seems nonsensical. Yet for the Christian, suffering should be expected. For one who is a servant of Christ, it is not a surprise that you would suffer in this world. There was most likely some that were seeking to discredit the validity of Paul's ministry because he was suffering. And Paul sets this straight. It is true that much suffering can come into one's life because of their own foolish choices and decisions and sin. There is a reap and sow principle that applies and much suffering comes at times into our lives because of our own sinful decisions. Yet there is a suffering that comes into our lives because of simply the effects of sin on this world. And again, there are sufferings that come directly related to being a follower and servant of Christ. And that is what Paul is referencing here. Whatever trial we face for any reason, we are to count it as joy, knowing God's superseding power over trials to use them in his people's lives for his glory and for their good. Yet what Paul is clearly referring to here are sufferings for the sake of Christ. And Paul makes this clear by his statement in the second half of verse 24, where he says, And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Suffering should be expected as part of ministry and service of Christ in the Christian life. Just consider 2 Timothy 2.12. 2 Timothy 2.12 says this, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Or consider 1 Peter 4.12-14. through 14. You don't have to turn there, but listen. Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are revealed, uh, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You see, we oftentimes get it backwards. Uh, If we have an easy life, we view that as God's blessing upon us. But here, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. There's a temptation to think good circumstances demonstrate we are doing well for God and negative circumstances or trials tempt us to believe the blessings of God are not upon us. 
Yet oftentimes, the clearest expression of God's blessing on our lives is when we are serving him faithfully in the midst of suffering and trials and hardship. We're serving him faithfully regardless of our circumstances. God has not promised believers a difficulty-free life. A trial-free life should not be expected for the Christian. In fact, we should be prepared for persecution. And the fact that Paul stayed true to his gospel ministry despite the difficulties he faced is a testimony to the blessing of God on his life and is an example for us. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings. This rejoicing is not a reactive emotional response to his circumstances, but it is a a decision of the will. It is a decision of the mind in the midst of his circumstances. Paul is not saying he rejoices because of his sufferings, but in the circumstances of suffering, he rejoices. He rejoices. Paul is choosing to view his situation with thankfulness, knowing God is at work to accomplish his purposes for his glory, for his people's own personal good. Paul determined to rejoice in his suffering. And what a helpful example for us, a a reminder for us that this rejoicing that Paul is doing is is a decision, a a logical conclusion based on what he knows to be true. And particularly what he knows to be true about God and God's sovereignty and God's goodness and God's purposes for his people. You see, we are not bound to our emotional responses, but we are to choose to view our circumstances with gratefulness because we know God is at work for his purposes, both in our own Christian lives and for his purposes around us. You see, Paul did not view himself as a victim of his circumstances, This is what God called him to do. He is doing the work God ordained for him. And he joyfully accepted his circumstances as being God ordained in order for God to accomplish his sovereign good purposes. This is right, but it it almost takes your breath away when you think about the hardship and the trials and the suffering and the difficulties that we face. This is no small task. Doctor reports, the death of loved ones, sickness, loss of relationships, miscarriages, desiring to have children and not being able to, staying and being faithful in the midst of hard marriages, Being estranged by children or parents or relatives, loss of employment, being mocked by neighbors, and many hardships and sufferings that we face, and additional hardships that very well may be coming quickly for Christians in our country. It's hard. Yet, in all of it, God has a purpose. God has a purpose in our suffering. There is never a moment of wasted suffering for the believer. God has a purpose for all of it. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Are are you suffering? Are you suffering right now for the sake of Christ? Listen, be be comforted. Be comforted in this. God has a purpose in your suffering. Suffering for the cause of Christ, though painful, is actually a spiritual privilege. That doesn't make it not hard. That doesn't make it not hurt. But what it does do is gives perspective to be able to rejoice even in it. And it's important to understand the attitude of rejoicing in suffering, particularly 
particularly for Christ's sake, should be the attitude in, in every believer. Suffering for the believer is, is promised to bring about good for the believer and glory for God. And thus Paul can say, I rejoice in my suffering. And sometimes we have the view that rejoicing is, is limited or exclusive. If we rejoice, we can't experience anything else. And this is false. There's, there is absolutely a way to be sorrowful over sin, to, to hurt and mourn, and to be saddened by the effects of sin, and still to rejoice in the purposes and faithfulness of God in the midst of those sufferings and hardships and trials and sorrows. To rejoice is is not to bury our trials in the ground or pretend like things aren't hard, but it is to maintain a perspective. It's rather for the Christian, and it is something to rejoice internal caused by the person of Jesus that is not based off of external things around us that can quickly be snatched away, but it is based on faith and confidence in the goodness of God and the purposes of God in our affliction. Only joy in God is an eternal, unshakable joy. As Paul rejoices in the midst of his suffering, he says he rejoices in his sufferings for your sake. He is suffering and it is for the Colossians' benefit. Paul understands that his imprisonment derived a benefit for the Colossian church that otherwise might not have been available for them. And this is how God works. He's so kind. He is so good to use the hardships and the various sufferings of his people for his sake to bless his people. Paul told the Philippians this very thing, that his imprisonment has turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And here we see God using Paul's suffering to also bring benefit to the church at large and specifically to the Colossians. Then Paul says, look at the second half of verse 24. And in my flesh, I do my share And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Paul uses the language that in his flesh, he does his share. His body is suffering, his physical body, on behalf of the body of Christ. And then he makes the statement in filling what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, first of all, I want to be very clear on what Paul is not saying here. Paul is not saying, he's not suggesting in any way that Christ's suffering was insufficient for redemption, for the forgiveness of sins. Paul just made so clear the reality that Jesus' sacrifice was fully sufficient for redemption. Jesus on the cross declared, it is finished. Nothing needs to be added to Christ's sacrifice. The Christian suffering in no way adds to the atoning work of Jesus and nothing needs to be suffered by the believer to aid or confirm in any way the salvation work that God accomplished through Jesus. Jesus paid it all. Jesus accomplished perfectly the satisfaction of the wrath of God for every believer. So what is Paul saying? Paul literally says, I fill up in turn what is lacking or what is a a measurable deficiency of afflictions relating to Christ. Paul's pointing out there is uh, that there's more suffering that will be inflicted on Christ's body, which is the church. This suffering is inevitable. And he's doing his share. He is participating appropriately and proportionately in this. So in what way, in what ways are Paul's sufferings, Christ's sufferings? Well, they're Christ's sufferings in as much as they are sufferings relating to Christ or or that have to do with Christ. 
Christ is not the immediate recipient of this persecution. It's not directly aimed at Christ. However, in Acts 9, Paul, who was still named Saul at the time on the Damascus road, is asked by Jesus, why are you persecuting me? And in Jesus' eyes, persecuting the church is essentially a direct attack of persecution towards him. Remember, Peter described being persecuted for Christ as sharing in the sufferings of Christ. When we, re- when we suffer as Christians for Christ, we are suffering along with Christ as his fellow brothers and heirs. Paul's participation in these inevitable sufferings for the church are not a hindrance to his credibility. And in fact, they demonstrate he is a faithful and trustworthy servant for Christ's sake. Now, a couple thoughts in relation to this. Is comfort or a trial-free life, a a conflict-free life, an idol for you? Are you fearful of what rights might be taken away from you? Are you you ready to suffer for Christ and to rejoice in it? Jesus suffered infinitely more than any of us ever will as he bore the wrath that we deserved in our sinfulness. Now that we have been forgiven our sins, are, are we ready to suffer for him? We shouldn't be surprised when suffering comes. Rather, we should be prepared to respond in a way that that honors Christ, that makes much of Christ. It seems oftentimes we exert ourselves more to trying to escape our afflictions, our sufferings, rather than exerting ourselves to faithfulness to Christ in them. Maybe on the other side of things, maybe you are a perpetual sufferer. Uh, Everywhere you go is a, a trial and everything wrong in your life is because you are the righteous one and others aren't treating you right. Listen, this this most likely isn't the case. It it might be, but most likely it's it's not the case. If you find yourself in this situation of perpetual suffering. You may want to, with humility and and willingness to hear the answer, ask a mature believer for their input on your perpetual suffering. It, It might be that you're not actually suffering for Christ. But rather there is, there is sin or an exaltation of other things in your life and you are clinging to some sort of noble notion that in these so-called acts of righteousness, you are doing them on Christ's behalf. We need to help each other. And we need to have humility to hear from one another. The first demonstration that Paul is a faithful and trustworthy minister is is that Paul rejoices in the inevitable sufferings relating to Christ. The next demonstration is this. Paul embraces his ministerial stewardship from God. He embraces his ministerial stewardship from God. Paul was made a minister, a servant of this church, he says. Look at verse 25. Of this church, I was made a minister. He's referring to the antecedent of this is his body, the church. He referred to in verse 24. And he's now again demonstrating his trustworthiness, his his faithfulness as a servant of God by the fact that he is not on a rogue mission. He's not on a rogue mission. He was made a servant by God. He was made a minister according to the stewardship from God. And stewardship is is related to the word commission, where someone is given a, a specific mission or duty. Within this word is implicit the idea that this one is to think and act in accordance to that stewardship. For Paul, the stewardship was his apostolic ministry. God stopped Paul in his destructive march against Christ and saved him. And not only saved him, but God made him a servant with his stewardship to accomplish specific ministry 
on God's behalf. In Paul being given this stewardship, God both granted divine authority and gave divine resources to Paul for this service. And Paul says this stewardship was for the benefit of the Colossians. So what was his stewardship? Well, Paul tells us. Uh, But the last clause is a little tricky to translate. The NASB says, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. And to smooth out the translation, they, they emphasize or add in preaching of. Do you see that there? It's italicized. In the ESV, it says to make the word of God fully known. In the NIV, it says to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Do you see that at the end of verse 25? Again, the NASB says, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of, they add that to smooth out the translation, the word of God. Paul says of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. And then literally it reads in the Greek to make full or to complete the word of God. The idea is not to fully preach the word of God, but to make known in a fullness of degree what was once a mystery. And this mystery was previously unknown, but now it has been made known. This mystery centers on the person of Christ and the reality that he dwells in his people. And this includes both Jews and Gentiles who have come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 26. Paul says, that is, The mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints. This was hidden, but now it has been manifested. It has been made visible. What was once unseen is now seen, and it is visible to his saints. Those whom Paul says in verse 27, God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There were those who believed in a coming Messiah. But no one saw or could see that the Messiah would come to dwell not only among his people, but within his chosen people. And not only Jews, but Gentiles also would be a part of that. This is staggering. This is really astonishing that Jesus dwells within the believer. Now, just for a moment, consider Consider this statement in light of what Paul has just described regarding Christ in verses 15 through 23. Do you remember? He's the image of the invisible God. He is the preeminent one above all creation. He is the creator of all things in heavens and on earth. Visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all have been created through him. All is created for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body, the church. He is, he is the beginning. He is the origination of the reconciling work of God. He's the preeminent one from the dead so that he will come to have first place in everything. It is through him that God is reconciling and bringing back into order all things under God's perfect reign. He also is the one who provided a means of reconciliation into direct fellowship with God through salvation by grace and faith. This Christ, this Jesus dwells in the believer. You share a union with Christ. He is in you and you in him. Christ takes up permanent residence within the believer. 
just for a moment, marvel and worship at the relationship and union with Christ we are able to have because of Christ in the gospel. Do you have this? Have you turned to Christ in faith and repentance? He he offers salvation to anyone who would repent and believe. It is available if you will but humble yourself before him and depend upon him wholly as the only means of forgiveness of sins that his sacrifice was was perfect and acceptable and what you could never do. Submit your life to Christ in repentance and faith. And if you would do that, I I ask you, please reach out to to me, to one of the elders of Grace Bible Church. We We would love to talk to you more and personally about what a relationship with Christ is. Love to do that. Would love to do that. Jew and Gentile both are in Christ and part of the body of Christ. What in the world can we not work through and and come to peace regarding as believers in light of the fact that, that we at Grace Bible Church, believers, we at Grace Bible Church have Christ in us. Just think about that. Think about the implications that this reality should have on our unity as a church, as fellow believers in Christ. Can we resolve to remember this reality when we find ourselves disagreeing on other things? Can we in holiness strive for unity on lesser things in light of the fact that we have Christ in us? Can we forgive quickly? Can we reconcile swiftly? Can we love abundantly? in light of this wonderful, shocking, glorious reality? Well, Paul then describes Christ in us. He says the hope of glory, that is the the confident assurance of future glory for eternity. This is the hope which consists in glory. This entire phrase is an epexegetical apposition to Christ in you, signifying that the indwelling of Christ in the believer is their assurance of coming glory. Every believer has this hope. And this hope is a a reoccurring theme in the book of Colossians. We saw it in verse 5. There is a hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. And then again in verse 23, the hope of the gospel that you have heard. And now again in verse 27, the hope of glory. We do well to remember often this hope We possess in the gospel that one day we will see Christ, we will be like him, that we will be glorified, never to sin again. What a a glorious thought. Paul is personally selected by God with a mission to make known the richness of God's glory and grace demonstrated to believers by the indwelling spirit of Christ. Paul embraced his ministerial stewardship from God and in so doing demonstrates himself to be a faithful and trustworthy servant of God. And being that he was granted this stewardship by the highest authority, the message he taught also carried the highest authority. The Colossians can have full assurance in the message Paul is bringing to them on behalf of God as he is a servant and messenger of God. So the first demonstration that Paul is a faithful and trustworthy minister is that Paul rejoices in the inevitable sufferings relating to Christ. Next, the demonstration that Paul of Paul is that he embraces his ministerial stewardship from God. And then thirdly, Paul proclaims Christ in order to present every man complete in Christ. That's number three. Paul proclaims Christ in order to present every man complete in Christ. Look at verse 28. 
Paul says, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Paul says, we proclaim him. We proclaim him. This is Paul's message, not merely a a philosophy or principle or system of rules, but it is a proclamation of a person. It is Jesus Christ. Paul says we proclaim him, and he says, admonishing every man and teaching every man. This is what it means for him to proclaim Christ. To proclaim Christ, he is doing this as he is admonishing and teaching. Admonishing is to warn or to exhort. It is to instruct in regards to one's belief or behavior. This is when one comes with a, a broken heart of concern for the other's good, not a, not a condescending disposition, but a sincere care for their well-being with a warning for that individual or correction for that individual. And Paul says they do this for every man. No one is beyond the need of admonishment. And isn't that just encouraging to hear? Do you you ever feel like you're singled out with correction? Why am I the only one getting admonished all the time? Listen, everyone needs to be admonished and yet people are picking on me. They keep coming at me. Listen, you're, you're not the only one who needs admonishment. In the same way that someone came to you in private, others are probably coming to them and so forth. This is what the body does. We admonish one another in love and care with compassion. If you never got admonished, you're probably not close enough to the body of Christ. Uh, This happens in the church. It, It needs to happen in the church. And it's arrogant and prideful to think that we would never need admonishment. Have you ever caught yourself being taken back by an admonishment? We probably need to be more surprised we are not receiving more admonishment than surprised when we receive admonishment. And if what is on our heart is that which is on Paul's heart to become mature or complete in Christ, why why would we view admonishment as a threat? It is an advocacy from a beloved fellow Christian to become more like Christ. That should be our desire. We, We may not always agree with the admonishment itself, but it shouldn't be offensive that someone would want to advocate for our holiness before the Lord. It should be received with with gratitude and humility and thankfulness, eager to open up our Bibles and and hear from one another. Paul says, admonishing every man and and teaching every man. If admonishing is is more of the warning of the negative, teaching is the, the careful or intentional, thorough imparting of spiritual truth in the positive. There is a an abiding, continuous nature of these ministries that are happening. Paul is admonishing. This is just a normal way of ministry, and he's teaching. This is a normal way of ministry, and so it should be in the church. There is an intentional instruction taking place with every man. And yet this isn't a, a rogue admonishment in teaching. This is flowing out of a, a proclamation of Christ and it is to be done with all wisdom. Do you see that in verse 28? Paul and his companions are doing this regularly with all wisdom. With all wisdom. This admonishment and instruction isn't rooted out of Paul's own preferences and opinions, but out of truth. It's rooted in Christ, and true wisdom is only found in God. Thus, a true understanding and application of Scripture must be our guide for each other in this. Paul has prayed for wisdom for the Colossians already in verse 9 in his prayer that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And here he makes clear that they're proclaiming, Paul and his pro his companions proclaiming of Christ as they admonish and teach is done with all wisdom. 
And then Paul next gives the purpose for why he's doing this. He says, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. And really verse 28 is a a mission statement per se for Paul and his companions and their ministry. To proclaim Christ, to admonish and to teach for the purpose of every man being found complete in Christ. Every man complete in Christ. This is spiritual maturity. To be complete in Christ is to be spiritually mature. This is being brought to the intended purpose. Paul longs to see every believer brought to maturity in Christ to be sanctified. To have no areas of deficiency in character or conduct, but to please the Lord. And he wants to see every believer, as he says, they will be presented before God one day in verse 22 as holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And if you haven't caught it already, look at the phrase every man in verse 28. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Three times Paul uses the phrase every man, and this isn't meant to draw attention to Paul's concern with men at the exclusion of woman, women. This is used to accentuate the reality that everyone should be receiving this admonishment and instruction so that every believer may be complete in Christ. This is intentional care for each person in the body of Christ. Truth is applicable to all, but people need individual help. Every man, every person. That's personal discipleship. That's that's the purpose of discipleship. That's the purpose of counseling and encouragement and life-on-life interaction and relationships. Listen, don't think that you can listen to sermons and read books and neglect the body of Christ. To think that you could be independent in your pursuit of Christ. I'll glean from the, the teachings of others from a distance. But I neglect actually rubbing shoulders with fellow believers, making myself available to admonishment and instruction and teaching. We need people who can see our deficiencies and admonish us. And we need people who can see our theological weaknesses and can strengthen us. We have an obligation to the body to use what God has gifted to us for the benefit of others. This isn't an assault on you as a person when someone comes to you with an admonishment or or teaching or aid for you, but it is an advocacy for your holiness before God. It's not to be driven by a, a legalistic desire to achieve some sort of outward appearance of righteousness, but it's to be driven by love that longs to see each other complete in Christ. Paul admonished. Paul taught intentionally. His companions did so as well. Paul proclaimed Christ. And this wasn't just merely a a hypothetical expression of realities about Jesus, but it was each man admonishing and teaching, instructing. He did it out of love, and this is good and right in our care for one another. He did it so that each, each, every person would be complete in Christ. Do you long for that in each other in Grace Bible Church? I think you do. I'm so grateful for that. Why did Paul persevere in gospel preaching? He wanted to, to disciple toward Christ likeness. Paul is a faithful Minister and a trustworthy servant of Christ as he was laboring, proclaiming Christ, that each person would be found complete in Christ. That should be our aim as believers, and that should be our desire in our care for one another.
when thinking about admonishing each other or instructing one another, we need to, we need to check, we need to consider, is, is Christ on my mind? And is the other person's holiness what I'm truly concerned with right now? Is my admonishment and instruction grounded in true biblical wisdom or my own thoughts, my own preferences? Lastly, as we finish up this morning, Paul, number four, labors in ministry, striving according to the power of Christ. Look at verse 29. Paul says, for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Paul is dedicated to the holiness of each believer. And he says, for this purpose, what he just mentioned in verse 28, he strives. The word for strives is where we get our word agonize from. It's often used to describe an athlete or runner who's running as hard as they can, though their body is screaming for them to stop. And that is what Paul is doing. He is working hard. He is diligent. He expends maximum effort to this end to see others complete in Christ. And it's painful or, or agonizing. He is striving for this. This is extreme work for Christ. Yet he wants to be crystal clear. He does not do this in his own strength. His, his expression of his own labors is not a testimony of his own greatness, but he does it according to Christ's power. He doesn't do it in his own strength. He does it according to or enabled by or in reliance upon his power. That is Christ's power. And Paul says, Jesus' divine power mightily works within me. Paul knew he needed Christ's power and he recognized the granting of that power generously from the Lord. Paul recognizes that anything that is good and pleasing to God in his ministry is accomplished by the power given from God alone in Christ. There's nothing Paul has done that has to do ultimately with him. Every accomplishment is an occasion to praise and give credit to and glory to Christ. Paul labors, yet it is not him, it is Christ in him. And a life laboring for Christ and the power of Christ is a life well spent to pursue holiness and to advocate for each other's holiness is a labor that God loves to empower his people to achieve. Let us labor to this end for one another. Let us labor to this end for one another that Christ might be glorified in and through our lives as we seek to exalt him in all that we do, to magnify him, to glorify him, knowing in our troubles, in our trials, in our tribulations, in our victories, in our accomplishments, It is not us, but it is Christ. It is his power that is working within us. And so he receives all the praise and he receives all the glory. We receive tremendous unparalleled benefit in him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this truth. I pray that as we observe Paul and his statements regarding his faithfulness and trustworthy minister ministry as a servant of Christ. I pray that we would follow him in this and that we too would be counted as faithful and trustworthy servants on behalf of Christ. Help us as a church to advocate for one another's holiness in the same way that Paul and his companions did, that we as a church each individual would be found complete in Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.